Hi everyone! Tonight's video is an introduction to microscopes. Cells are very, very small, so we need microscopes to see them. We need microscopes to magnify them, to, a, to make them big enough so that we can see them. Tonight I'm going to cover three different types of microscopes. There are more types than this, but these are three very common types that I want you to know about. The first is called a compound light microscope. The next is a dissecting scope. And the third is called an electron microscope. So we'll talk about each one of these and their advantages and disadvantages individually. Let's start with the compound light microscope pictured here. We will be using these extensively in the classroom. The compound light microscope uses visible light to illuminate its specimen. And the light is transmitted. That means the light goes all the way through the specimen. So let's look at how this works. The light source in a compound microscope is down here at the base. And the light comes from the light source. It goes through something called a condenser, which focuses that light beam. It goes through another structure called a light diaphragm, which adjusts how much light is allowed through. It actually opens and closes, kind of like an eye. The light then passes through the stage. The stage is where your specimen is that you're looking at. And the specimen have to be thin to be looked at in a compound microscope. They're very thin and they're placed on a glass slide. So the light comes from the light source, through the condenser, to the light diaphragm, through your specimen here on your glass slide, and then it goes into one of these objectives. This is the first place of magnification. There are different objectives that magnify to different levels. An objective can be as low as a four times magnification, and that is indicated with a 4x, and that x is critical. It's the unit of magnification, so if we would always call this the 4x objective, never just the 4 objective. You can have a 10x objective, a 100x objective. You would adjust these objectives depending on what magnification you would want to see. The light goes through the objective and then up here through the ocular or the eyepiece, which is where you actually look in the microscope. The ocular is a second place where magnification occurs. So because there is a double magnification, we call this a compound microscope because the magnification is compounded. So if the total magnification could be anywhere from 40x to 1000x, depending on if you used the 4x objective with a 10x ocular, that's a 40x total magnification, or if you had a 100x objective and a 10x ocular, that's a 1000x total magnification. A couple of other pieces on this compound microscope. How do we focus this microscope? Well, we have two knobs. We have a very large knob here called the large focus or the gross focus. This moves the stage up and down in very large motions. So if you need to just get even close to magnifying. Then we have what's called the fine focus, this small knob here. This moves the stage in very, very small increments. So you can just get it just adjusted just right for your eyes. The last piece is what's called the nose piece. And this is just what our objectives are screwed into. It holds on to our objectives. You can view live cells and actually watch cellular processes as they're occurring in a compound light microscope. You can watch cells divide and move and swim, and we will do this in the classroom. You can see things as small as 200 nanometers. That's the size of a small bacteria, um, but that is about the limit of what you can see in a compound light microscope. Next, we have the dissecting microscope. This uses visible light to illuminate, but it uses reflective light usually. Some dissecting scopes can use transmitted light, but most of them use a, a reflection light. And let's go through that process. So our light source is up here, it's above, and the light comes down to your specimen down here and bounces off, coming back up into the microscope. So it's reflected, we call this reflected light. So when that light comes down here, your specimen is down here on the stage. And then the light bounces off your specimen and comes up to your objective, which is this large circular piece here. The light will go through the objective, which is where the first magnification occurs. And it will come up through here through the ocular. These ocular pieces may 
or may not be a second place of magnification. So sometimes your dissecting microscopes compound the magnification, sometimes they just have the magnification of the objective. The total magnification is very low. It's between 7.5 and 40x, depending on the dissecting microscope. So this magnifies to a much smaller amount than your compounding microscope. But it's used for large specimens or whole organisms. You could put a frog on this and you could look at it and almost think of this dissecting scope like a magnifying glass that you don't have to hold. You can actually manipulate specimens on the stage. They're called dissecting microscopes because you can dissect dead things while looking at it through the microscope. But you also can use this for living organisms. You can look at a flower, you can look at a frog, you can look at all sorts of large things on this dissecting microscope because the specimen doesn't have to be thin and placed on a slide like it does for a compound microscope. What about an electron microscope? This is not something you'll get to use in the classroom. It uses a beam of electrons to illuminate the specimen. So we need to talk a little bit about how this works and why would you want to use an electron beam instead of a light beam. We need to talk about something called magnification versus resolution. If I show you this picture here, it's not very large. It's not very magnified. And you might actually have a hard time seeing what are these little dots in this green thing in this picture. But if I magnify it, you can clearly see that these are ants clear, carrying away some poor hapless caterpillar that happened to die. If I make this picture even bigger, I've magnified it, but I've lost what we call resolution. When I went from this small picture to this bigger picture, it helped. I could see things that were bigger and I could clearly differentiate between this ant and that rock. However, when I made it bigger still, it did get bigger but it didn't get any clearer. I cannot resolve the difference between this ant and the background. So resolution is the ability to distinguish two objects as separate entities. And when you're using visible light, when you magnify more and more, at some point you lose resolution. You lose that ability to distinguish two objects as separate entities. So it's limited in, in visible light. Resolution is limited. However, if we use something with a shorter wavelength, you can get better resolution. Let's look at the different wavelengths of light. You have visible light in this range and the wavelength is fairly large. But if we go down to the shorter wavelengths of light, we are able to actually resolve things as separate entities using this small wavelength of light. The electron microscope uses an electron beam with wavelengths of light farther down into this small wavelength range. And that means it can see things as small as molecules. So the compound microscope can see something as small as a bacteria, but an electron microscope can see the molecules within that bacteria. It does, however, have some very serious limitations. In order to see something in an electron microscope, the specimen first has to be encased in plastic, sliced incredibly thin, stained with heavy metals, and viewed in a vacuum. That means you can only view dead things, dead cells in the electron microscope. So if you wanna watch a process as it's happening, if you wanna watch a cell moving or a cell dividing, you can't do that in an electron microscope because it's already dead. Electron microscopes look a little bit more like computers than they do microscopes, but they produce these amazing images. There's two different types of electron microscopes. This is a picture from a transmission electron microscope, which is abbreviated TEM, where you get a very extremely thin slice through a cell. So this is the cell membrane, and these are individual organelles inside the cell. It's incredibly small, but again, this cell is dead because in order to prepare it to be seen in the electron microscope, it had to be encased in plastic, put in a vacuum, stained with heavy metal. There's a second type of electron microscope called a scanning electron microscope, or an SEM, and that shows you the surface of cells. These here happen to be red blood cells, and I know this because of the concave part of it. And then we've got small platelets. We have some other immune cells here. It gives you some amazing pictures of the outside surfaces of cells, but again, these cells are dead. 
because they've had to be encased in plastic. So what you should know. For each type of microscope, you should know what type of illumination. Is it light or electron beam? Is it transmitted or reflected? What can be viewed? Can you see large things, small things? Does it have to be on a slide? Does it have to be living? Does it have to be dead? Uh, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of each type of microscope? And then you must also be able to label all the parts of a compound light microscope that we, we, we will be using in the classroom. So that's all for tonight.